I've heard some say that this September has been abnormally hot and muggy. And I've also heard some people say that just to wait a little bit longer, mid-October is on its way. It's almost here when it'll get a little cooler. Well, it's hard for me to wait. And if you are shivering tonight, it's because I jacked up the, uh, the AC just a little wee bit, a little bit. I apologize. Um, and I also have a story to share with you this evening of a winter Olympian named Eddie. So if you're chilled already, I apologize you might just have to snuggle up with your neighbor a little bit. Well, Eddie was born in Cheltenham, England. He was a good downhill skier. And in 1984, he only missed making the Great Britain ski team by a narrow margin. To improve his chances to qualify for 1988, he moved to Lake Placid in the U.S. to train. However, he soon found himself short on funds. To realize his Olympic dream, he decided to switch to ski jumping because, number one, it was cheaper, having no sponsors or wealth. He was doing all this on his own. And number two, it would be much easier to qualify for the national ski team to be a ski jumper because he was the only one. In many ways, Eddie was substandard to anyone else training for the ski jump. Eddie looked decidedly not athletic. It's been said that his yellow jumpsuit that he wore in ski jumping looked more like him as Winnie the Pooh than a sculpted athlete that we usually see with the Olympics. Now, even though Eddie was only 25 years old, he was also about 20 pounds heavier than the standard ski lift competitor. His old used boots were so big he had to wear six pairs of socks to make them fit. And to top it all off, Eddie was very, very farsighted. And due to his bad eyesight, Eddie had to wear his glasses at all times, even while he was skiing. And his glasses would fog up to the point that he really couldn't see where he was going. Now, while working as a plasterer and living at a Finnish mental hospital due to his lack of funds, Eddie represented Great Britain at the, 198, at the, 18, the 1987 World Championships and the ski jump. His determination paid off. Having substandard training and using second-rate equipment, Eddie Edwards was ranked 55th in the world, which qualified him to represent Great Britain as their only and first ski jump Olympian in the 1988 Winter Olympics in Calgary. Now, on the way to Calgary, the airline lost Eddie's luggage. And on the day of his competition, the Olympic security agents almost didn't let Eddie through the gate. Because they later said, quote, the chunky man's Coke bottle glasses were so thick they knew he was an imposter. But he did eventually get in, and he didn't do very well. Outside Magazine said that in the air, Eddie looked like an errant slush ball. And when it was all over, Eddie came in 56th place out of 57 jumpers, although the 57th man had been disqualified. But here's the thing. Even though Eddie came in last place, the world loved him. Johnny Carson even had Eddie flown down to Burbank to appear as, uh, on The Tonight Show. TV crews and newspapers from all over the world clamored to interview Eddie. Once he got back into England, he was treated like a full-blown celebrity. In the athletic world, Eddie was no Greg Louganis or Mary Lou Retton or Michael Jordan. Eddie was the exception, not the rule. With someone like Michael Jordan, it doesn't take long for people to come up with slogans like, be like Mike. But no one was saying, be like Eddie. Eddie the Eagle Edwards was a lousy ski jumper, but he really loved it. In fact, he had hoped to compete again in the future Olympics, but it turned out that Olympic officials didn't like Eddie much and felt that he re reflected badly on the games. So they instituted what some call the Eddie Rule, which requires all athletes to have finished the top half of an international sporting event as a prerequisite for getting into the Olympics. Now, the Eddie Rule may not keep out those quote unquote losers out of the Olympics because the Olympic folks don't mind having people lose, because without losers, there would be no winners. 
But if a so-called loser gets worldwide attention, the winners seem diminished. And in this world, losers are supposed to fade away quietly so that winners can occupy the center stage. Well, Jesus, in our gospel lesson this evening, would have us adopt a rather different point of view, and I fully agree. Since nothing is new under the sun, even in biblical times, there was a sense of winners and losers, the strongest and the weakest, the best and the worst, the greatest and the least. And as Jesus and his disciples walked along the way to Capernaum, the disciples did something that many of us have done, I think, ourselves, amongst friends or with siblings, maybe at the office or even in church. They argued about who among them was the greatest. Jesus knew he had to nip this in the bud, so he sat them all down and called the twelve to, the, to, to himself and gave them words of wisdom, words to live by. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. I'm sure that Eddie the Eagle would have loved to have his picture in the paper and a full-length article in a magazine all about his hopes and dreams going into the Olympics, as we've read many of our favorites over the years. But he was so unknown that he almost didn't even get into the gates. Did he have dreams of ascending the podium and receiving an Olympic medal? Of, sh of course he did. Who wouldn't? But even though he wasn't the most stylish, the, the fittest, or the financially, financially backed with big sponsors, he got on the slopes and did what he loved to do with humility, joy, and enthusiasm for his country and love for the sport. And even though he came in last, he came out on top, setting a, a British ski jump record and becoming known and loved worldwide. Even at the closing ceremony, the president of the organizing committee, Frank King, seemed to single out Edwards for his contribution, saying, at these games, some competitors have won gold, some have broken records, and some of you have even soared like an eagle. Again, Jesus said, whoever wants to be first must be last of all, and servant of all. We live in a world of movers and shakers. Success seems to be generally measured by how much you accomplish in life, who you know, what you drive, where you live, how you dress, how much you own. Well, as we read God's word, we see that success in the eyes of God is totally countercultural counter to that. For God looks at the heart and soul and how we live our lives because of who lives inside of us. It's all about standing in and upon the love you have in your heart for God and for others. That is why Jesus takes a child in his arms in this teaching of his disciples to hit home the, the, the truth of humility. For a child is the opposite of worldly greatness. I don't know if we have any children in here, but maybe tomorrow we will. But don't, they're not that bad, but, but let's think about it for a second. When you think about children, say seven or eight, wh who do they know of influence? What do they drive? Hopefully nothing at that age, right? Where do they live? How do they dress? What do they own? Children are dependent upon those around them. And there is little of their own that they can stand upon boastfully basking in their own greatness. Rather, they stand upon the shoulders of others in the family or upon a family name or upon the success of their mother or father or grandparent as we stand upon the greatness of our Lord and our God with all humility. Then when we boast, we boast about whose we are and what the Lord is doing in us and through us, and among us. It's not us who is doing it out of our own greatness. It is God who chooses to do great and wonderful things through us, who, who say yes to his call upon our life, to be his hands and his feet 
in the world around us. In our epistle from James, he gives us a couple marks of those who would be servants of all as they stand upon the Lord God in this world. Such a person is full of, is first of all in touch with true wisdom, says James, which is manifested through living a good life with God at the helm. Quote, James says, wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. Contrast that to those who stand upon earthly wisdom, who revel in envy and selfish ambition, which is, in James's understanding, unspiritual and devilish. Second, those who are servant of all, as Jesus speaks, are not driven by, by covetousness, seeking those things that they do not have by any means possible, and ending in dispute and conflict, but rather they are driven by humility, asking God our creator and sustainer for the desires of our hearts, drawing near to God that he would draw near to us. For scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Our Lord God is pleased with us as his children when we live humbly day to day, doing our best not to think of ourselves so highly, but to think of ourselves with sober judgment. There is a motto that I've tried to live by my adult life, having come across it years ago and continuing to teach it whenever I can. It's called the I'm third motto. Very simply, it's the understanding and orientation of one's life that in all things, God is first, others are second, and I'm third. Brothers and sisters, the desire to be great is in each one of us, and doing great things is commendable. We don't have to come in 56th place, as Eddie the Eagle did. But the truth of the matter is, if we humble ourselves before the Lord, he will lift us up. Therefore, we are called to seek God above all other things, to live according to his commandments and his purposes, having not in mind the things of earth, but to have in mind things from above, heavenly things, putting on Christ, loving and ministering to others as we ourselves want to be loved and ministered to, all bringing glory to God. May we forever remember these challenging and insightful words of, of our Lord and Savior and of his disciples. Teach them to our children, to our grandchildren, to anyone we can. Model them on a daily basis that we may be visible agents of God's love and grace. And with all humility, soar above all things like an eagle. For whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all. Amen.